So I want you to do something with me very quickly. I want you to think about a leader or a friend or an individual that you're not related to necessarily who had taught you a skill of some sort in your life. Think about the process of learning that skill. This educational process is extremely important when learning how to interact with other individuals. Okay? It doesn't have to happen in a classroom and often does not. This type of process is often called mentoring, to be mentored in something, right? Women suffragists, also known as Votes for Women Reformers, were both women and men who worked to gain the right to vote for women in the late 19th and early 20th century. Usually, historians talk about the movement in the United States running from about 1848 until the first Seneca Falls, during the first Seneca Falls Convention until the passage of the 19th Federal Amendment in 1920. Over the course of this almost century, generations of women's rights reformers, both men and women, which is very important, learned from each other and mentored those in the movement on what work with campaigning and leadership and how legal processes worked and how to gain the attention and support on the of the general public and legislators. Just like you were mentored, they mentored each other. Or just like maybe you've been a mentor, they men mentored each other. This passing along of information of process is extremely important and became essential in the information between national leaders and also between state and regional leaders among themselves but also in then returning information back to national um, suffrage supporters. Sometimes it even brought people into the movement. For example, during the spring of 1870, in the midst of increased suffrage activity mounted by two competing national associations at that point, a woman named Marianna Thompson, who had graduated from St. Lawrence University, who was the, and she had graduated and then become ordained and was the fifth ordained woman in the United States, okay? Following this, she took a position at a large and influential church in Grand, Grand, Rapid, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she met a future women's rights leader, Anna Howard Shaw. Anna Howard Shaw was very young at that point, and she had gone to hear Marianna Thompson, who later would get married and her name would be Marianna Thompson Folsom, to, she got, went to hear her speak. And afterwards, this is what Shaw had to say about it. Before I had been working a month in, at my con, in, congenial trade in Big Rapids, I was favored for, by a visit from a Universalist woman minister, the Reverend Mariana Thompson, who came there to preach. Her sermon was delivered on Sunday morning, and I was, I think, almost the earliest arrival of the great congregation which filled the church. It was a wonderful moment when I saw my first woman minister enter her pulpit. And as I listened to her sermon, thrilled to my soul, all my early aspirations to become a minister myself stirred in me with culminative force. After the services, I hung around for a time on the fringe of the group that surrounded her. So you can kind of see this young person hanging off the side, waiting to talk to this hero, right? And at last, when she was alone and ab about to leave, I found the courage to introduce myself and pour forth the tale of my ambition. Her advice was as prompt as if, I, if she had studied my problem for years. My child she said. You can't do anything until you have an education. Get it and get it now. Her suggestion was to my liking and I paid her the compliment of acting on it promptly. For the next morning, I entered the Big Rapids High School, which was also a preparatory school for college. Now, Shaw eventually earned her doctorate in theology and became the first clergywoman ordained by the Methodist Protestant Church. She also earned a medical degree from Boston University in 1886. Eventually, Anna Howard Shaw served as president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association from 1904 to 1915, and one of the key national suffragists during the period in which, leading up to um, the federal amendment being passed. Can you all see the mentoring here? Go and do it. This is how the process works. Shaw's anecdote also tells us a lot about how information can be obtained. This was a one-moment situation. Now, these two women became friends and stayed friends for the rest of their life. Marianna Thompson, who eventually became Marianna Thompson Folsom, moved to Texas. And she became one of the early suffrage activists in the 1880s, um, traveling around 
and campaigning for women to get the right to vote through giving speeches and writing newspaper articles. Another example of this mentoring and communication in networks came in 1890 with a woman named Annette Finnegan. Now, Annette Finnegan was from Houston, and she had moved to New York for graduate school at Columbia University. At that time, she helped organize a small suffrage club that was soon absorbed into the newly reorganized New York Woman Suffrage League. Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association from 1895 to 1905, and then again from 1915, right after Anna Howard Shaw steps down through the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, was the president of that league. And her and Annette Finnegan became friends. Finnegan was first corresponding secretary, and a number of well-known women of social prestige were active members. What happened at that point was that after Annette Finnegan worked with the New York suffragists, and she learned how to campaign, how to keep records, how to lobby, and most importantly, how to organize, how to go out and get other people who were interested in this to come to meetings and to form clubs, and for them to organize on behalf of the movement. She moves back to Texas between 1902 and 1903, most likely at the order of Carrie Chapman Catt and other national leaders. Why? Because Annette Finnegan was sent back to Texas to help reorganize the suffrage association that kind of floundered in, in the last few years. Finnegan had learned from Catt all of these campaigning endeavors, all of these ideas, all of these organizing um, processes, and brings them back to Texas. And from 1903 through 1906, especially, there's a heightened point of organizing around women suffrage in Texas. While Finnegan and actually her sisters are also bringing in women from Houston, from Galveston, mostly from port cities along the Gulf. There's a downturn in Texas suffrage at that point as far as activity is concerned at the state level. Local associations stay very active. But between 1913 and 1915, we see a reorganization at the state level. And Annette Finnegan becomes president of, during one of these years. At that point, Annette Finnegan saw the necessity to hand off the baton of leadership. And she reaches out and she's looking for new leaders and a new generation. So do you see the generational movement? I'm starting this timeline in 1848 with just the beginning of what we call the suffrage movement in the US. I talked about 1870 as that example with um, Anna Howard Shaw. And then we're talking about 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, and we're talking about generations of leaders and generations of women that are passing the baton, but also passing this information. And Annette Finnegan chooses a woman from Galveston. She's from both Galveston and the New Waverly area, which is right outside of Huntsville, named Minnie Fisher Cunningham. Cunningham had become a staple in the local and state suffrage organizing and campaigning in various areas of the state. And in 1915, Annette Finnegan chose her to be the next president of the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. Cunningham worked with Texas suffragists at that point to further organize more suffrage associations at the local level. But one of the things she was most known for was her record keeping. And this is very interesting because she kept cards of information of all the legislators, how they were going to vote, who were their constituents, any suffragists in the area that could go and lobby them in their home office. And this information was passed from Finnegan to her on how to organize in this way. And so Cunningham, at this point, is doing this for the Texas Association and gets to be known very well in the national, by the national suffragists. And one of the people that she comes in close contact with is Carrie Chapman Catt, none other than the woman who had mentored Annette Finnegan in the 1890s. She works with Carrie Chapman Catt and others not only to bring Texas to be the first southern state to ratify the 19th Amendment, but after that ratification in 1919, to go to other states, especially in the South, like Mississippi, and organize like this and help their suffragists organize again. And one of the things that she took with them was this card catalog idea. And so what we see is not only information that is very specific on how to organize, but also messages and campaigning efforts on how to reach out and how to organize local clubs. 1920 is when the 19th Amendment ratified. But these women did not stop, and neither, or men, who were supporting suffrage. But instead, they go on to other movements. And these movements enormously affect and then move on into what my other panel colleagues here are going to discuss. <laughs>